Thank you all very much for a really amazing two days. Uh, and and uh, it's my great pleasure here to uh, introduce our winner this year of the Dallas Smythe Award. Uh, the Dallas Smythe Award uh, is given in memory of one of the great pioneers of the study of political economy of communications and one of the great leaders in the struggle for democratic communications. At each conference, the Union for Democratic Communications honors a critical media scholar slash activist whose work exhibits the spirit of engagement, democracy, teaching, and rebelliousness to which the UDC is committed. And so this year, this award is being given to Sophia Noble Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor of Communication at the University of California, Los Angeles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah hell, about two, all right, so I'm just gonna ignore the two hours of sleep or so. To introduce her and to save me from myself, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Christina Cecil, Associate Professor of Communications at California State University, Fullerton. Please welcome her to do a proper introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. It is my grand pleasure to be here to introduce Dr. Sophia Noble to you all because she is so wonderfully humble and great to talk to that you will forget all her accolades by the end of this conversation. So just to set us up, Dr. Sophia Noble is an Internet Studies Scholar and Professor of Gender Studies, African American Studies, and Information Studies at UCLA, where she serves as the Faculty Director of the Center on Race and Digital Justice and the Co-Director of the Mundaru Initiative on Tech and Power at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She is a research associate at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford, where she was a commissioner on the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. In 2021, she was recognized as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow for her groundbreaking work on algorithmic discrimination. In 2022, she was recognized as the inaugural NAACP R12 Digital Civil Rights Award recipient. She's a chartering member of the International Panel on the Information Environment and the Interim Director of the UCLA Data X Initiative. Her academic research focuses on the internet and its impact on society. Her work is both sociological and interdisciplinary, making the ways that digital media intersects with issues of race, gender, culture, power, and technology. She is regularly sought out for her expertise on issues of algorithmic discrimination and technology bias by national and international press, including The Guardian, the BBC, CNN International, USA Today, Wired, Time, <laughs> Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, and The New York Times, and most epically, painful. Rolling Stone. <laughs> Rolling Stone, come on. <laughs> I could go on and on, <laughs> but I think I've embarrassed her enough. So let's get started with our conversation. Great. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. I can't think of a better moment in UDC's past and future to be begin having this conversation. And so when we began discussing, when I told Sophia that she was the recipient, she brought up, like, let's do it as a conversation. Let's do it, you know, more casual, more conversational, and hopefully we can bring that element and that spirit of camaraderie into the Smythe Award lecture as well as, um, you know, a wonderful way of Book ending. Yes, I love to turn one mic into many mics. So if I could get a couple more of you up here, I would. So thank you so much for this incredible award. I um, was really stunned when you called me and told me that I had won it um, because, <clears throat> you know, this is a group of scholars that I have looked up to my whole academic career. Um, there are so many people in this room. Um, <clears throat> who really deeply influenced my work uh, when I was a student and also as I continue to learn. And I'm sorry that I wasn't here to learn with you these last couple of days. But I just want to say that um, sometimes it's the recognition of your peers in the struggle, um, which I really uh, relate to UDC as being that community. So I just want to say that I'm very grateful to be recognized by you and by the co-chairs, thank you, and the committee. And I'm excited to be in this conversation. We're good. We got plenty of time, so please participate in it with us today, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, so when we started discussing the format and the sort of way in which we were gonna approach, you wanted to approach the Smythe Lecture, we're texting back and forth, and then Sophia sends me a text. She's like, oh, I'm in Bali, by the way. 
And I was like, why? And then I caught myself, I was like, why not? <laughs> And then you mentioned that, of course, you were attending uh, the Global Digital Human Rights Conference with a group of other women activists from around the world. Yep. And I thought, what a great way to start this conversation off with an organization that wants to bring scholarship into the public sphere. And so can you tell me a bit more about that meeting and about who you met and what you all were doing there? Yeah, sure, I will. So. Um, it, first of all, Bali is such an incredibly beautiful place, and the people of Bali were so supportive and interested in the kind of um, just holding space for conversations um, of women of color who are on the front lines around the world. In fact, I didn't feel nearly as um, much on the front lines. I mean, I am maybe as a scholar, but there were women there who uh, have been recognized by an organization called the Owano Foundation that brought us all together. They're a Canadian foundation, family foundation. And these are women from Chile, from Venezuela. Um, many of them, you could go and look at the Owano Foundation, their, their kind of page on global leaders if you want to know their names. Um, women who are on the front lines of uh, fighting for the Rohingya in Myanmar against companies like Facebook, we all know, um, women from Brazil, uh, our own Jessica Gonzalez, who's a co-president of Free Press, uh, other uh, uh, women from Azerbaijan, Malaysia, just pl places where communications and the internet in particular have been used and weaponized against our communities. And so this was something that we all shared in common. I certainly experience and understand that as a black scholar and seeing the way in which um, not only is the internet and communications channels weaponized against black communities in terms of you know everything from voter disinformation to anti-vax and other kinds of propaganda campaigns that are foisted upon us, um, but also just the profoundly anti-democratic nature of these kinds of propagandistic movements that are afoot around the world and that are unfolding in front of us every day. So this was a time for us to gather, which doesn't really happen because many times, um, and I know people in this room understand this experience, for women of color, we are often kind of just like, uh, you know, either an afterthought or we are not in the majority in the spaces where we work and um, do a lot of our intellectual work too um, and scholarly work. We work in universities or in different kinds of spaces that are not always um, centering the things that we would center. So this was a really amazing opportunity for us to get together and think about what does it mean for us to coordinate solidarity, um, scholarship, um, resistance, work together. How do we do this? This is, you know, I think for me, I found this incredibly challenging to think about being kind of in the heart of the American empire where American companies are so implicated in the kinds of things that my colleagues are experiencing and their communities are experiencing. So kind of what is my responsibility? What is our responsibility? The three of us who were there from the U.S. Um, but, you know, there's so much uh, and I will also add that one of the things that was really incredible about this gathering that I haven't experienced in any other uh, such environment um, was they brought in a somatic healer and a person who did, taught us how to kind of release the trauma of the kinds of work that we all do from our bodies. And so I learned some things. And like I'm always doing this now, just kind of you know touching my arms and crossing the meridian and just thinking about what does it mean to um, embody these struggles and also have those struggles take over our bodies. And so many of us there have dealt with all kinds of um, struggles related to um, the way in which we've internalized the pain of the things that we experience too and see and that our communities are experiencing and that the world is experiencing really, not just limited to our communities. So um, I highly recommend bringing a somatic healer to all of our work because <laughs> we got a lot to let go. <laughs> but it's amazing like what it means to, um, you know, to integrate the work that we do, it is not just an intellectual project. You know, these are also kind of um, emotional, spiritual, psychic, you know, kinds of 
ways that we move through the world. And um, we hold a lot of feeling. And that feeling has to go somewhere. And we have to be able to mobilize it as well as part of our resistance work. And, and I think the headline that came from that meeting was, everyone, and I know that everyone in this room um, shares this, or probably most of you, uh, which is we need to carve out more space to imagine an alternate reality, right? And in alternate futures. And that is really kind of the headline. And so um, I love being here to even tonight on the heels of that because I feel like this is kind of the intellectual home where we can also and should be and should demand of ourselves um, thinking not just about the problems and the seizures that we experience, but also like what are the futures that we want? And to me that is like, there's nothing more feminist than that. Um, so I, I loved that experience and I feel really grateful to have had it. That is amazing. I love the way the somatic healing brings to mind this, for me at least, this dichotomy that we have, especially you know in the US academia between, you know, it's all in my head, right? Like I don't, I'm at the laptop, I'm, crunched over, even if your body says it hurts, like you're just going to stay there till the grading's done. Um, but how important it is to... <laughs> or maybe there's no, some like self-medicating that's all happening all like... also while the grading is going on. I don't know. I, I've just read about that. Yeah. yeah. No, but there's something so really moving about thinking about um, both the ways in which activism we know takes a toll. Yes. Right? Emotional, physical, spiritual. And the way, though, that we can also bring in and create communities that also provide spaces for healing. Yeah, and the the academy takes a toll on us. Um, I have been really just thinking a lot about um, the black woman who, at Temple. Um, I, many of you know Joanne. Is it Epps? I think was her last name. I want to say she was a, a black woman. Um, it, at a meeting at Temple and drops dead in the meeting. Maybe you saw this a couple of months ago. Yeah, on stage. And they take her out and then continue on with the meeting. Oh. And um, that has really affected me, that story. Um, just thinking about the cruelty of the spaces that we create to do this work that we call like liberatory or education. Um, like we have such a responsibility to at home in the places where we work say refuse that kind of of culture and indifference so um, you know it's not just the things that are kind of happening out there it's the things that are happening in here too right no that's really wow I had not heard that yeah, story it's I'm a still terrible kind of story like, wow um, and actually that brings me to something um, about critical scholarship in general, and what we can do as critical scholars in assisting the kind of social movements that you are engaging with at this conference in Bali. Where do you see critical scholarship and the sort of work we're doing here um, assisting, supporting, liaisoning yeah, well, with this broader transnational network? I think that in, in the case of the place where I was in Bali, I mean, you know, there was like uh, Maori from New Zealand, scholars, I mean, indigenous and First Nations women, and um, they're all scholars. So, you know, in that way, there was a, a very, um, you know, acute level of analysis that you could get in on. And all of us, I think, try to work in spaces where, where we are um, in relationship with different kinds of social movements. So I, and organizations, civil and human rights organizations. So I think the critical scholarship is absolutely there, there believe it or not. It, sometimes it doesn't feel like that. I think in the US, we're not always sure if we're just kind of talking to ourselves, but I don't think that that's the case. And um, I can say at least here in the US with the different organizations that I have been able to, and I, I run a new center called the Center on Race and Digital Justice. And it's whole reason, we've just kind of, you know, we've got a chapter at UCLA. I hope one day we'll have kind of um, clusters of colleagues at many different campuses um, for the express purpose of bringing uh, critical scholarship and research and facts and knowledge out of the academy and helping social movements engage with that and use that to strengthen their campaigns, to um, 
better testify in front of legislative bodies from municipal, state, and federal. So that's a thing that we're doing now. Mostly that work is focused on, um, you know, campaigns like Stop Shot Spotter um, or um, legacy civil rights organizations who are like, what's wrong with tech? You know, or you're like, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> trying to just figure out how to give language to different kinds of organizations so that they have the kinds of um, uh, facts that will help mobilize people and mobilize policy change. Um, so the other thing is, I would just say, I think that when I look out and the different networks that I'm in, people are engaging. I mean, the, the, the critiques that come from communities are also, they may not be packaged in the kind of scholarly uh, products, for lack of a better word, that we have to develop as a part of our work, but um, they're definitely, you know, epistemologies that are happening um, in communities that are very important, and and so it's it's a false binary or you know um, dichotomy between the academy and communities. There's actually a lot of powerful feedback looping happening together. And I think it's important to kind of, it's so important for me to hear that, actually. Just me, I'm sure you all already knew. Uh, because it does feel so siloed off, like when we're in the thick of the semester. Only in faculty meetings where yeah, people hate us. You know. um, but, <laughs> but outside of that, we're good, I think. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Oh, sleep at night. Um, and so actually, one of the other things that this makes me think about is... Um, Within the United States, I think we feel a little bit limited in our critique of capitalism. I know I've talked to a few people sort of about like what makes UDC distinct? Why do we feel so at home here? And one of the things that's come up again is that you can just be anti-capitalist and people are like, right? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. No one's tripping. <laughs> that's what sucks. So, I mean, how does that shift when you begin to work transnationally in the way that you are? How does, I mean, what does it look like from the rest of the world? That's a really interesting question. It's a tough one. I mean, I think it's not even, it's an open secret that most of the um, countries of the global majority, which is how I would characterize what others might call the global south um, or, you know, the third world, I'll say people of the global majority, uh, are have ha long standing critiques of empire and capitalism. In fact, we've most of us in the US have gotten our good critiques from them. Um, so, you know, we should not, uh, and the, you know, I live in LA, so I've been so attuned to the Writers Guild strike and the actor strike. My husband's here, my son, my husband's an actor. He's now going, going to kill me that I said that. <laughs> I'm gonna IMDB like, you like, right she, after this. Um, <laughs> I'm not here. <laughs> Teddy bear sweater, he's, he's, he's yeah. in the, he's acting like he's cool now. He's, he it's very good method that. is really working for you. Yeah, here. he's. <laughs> but I think, that was a very powerful, the Writers Guild strike was a very profound critique of capital. It wasn't the way that we want to see, like the way it might happen in, in other parts of the world. Where And we don't strike in the streets in the same way that people do in other countries. Um, um, but I will say that, um, you know, there was nothing more amazing than seeing the writers and the actors, you know, like drag the... Uh, big media companies for filth, you know, as they were truly giving their assessments. I mean, I was stunned to see, and I'm not naming names because I feel like this, this world is so small that we're in, but there was a executive of a really big company that <laughs> represents Mickey Mouse, and he was saying, you know, basically, like, we'll just starve him out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? And, you know, the writers and the actors had something to say. Now, when I saw the clip when he did that, gave that interview on the media, and it was from Sun Valley, which many of you may know. Sun Valley, Utah is where the billionaires um, play. 
and uh, invite in scholars. We happen, I happen to have a friend this year who was invited in as the talent to give a lecture on public education, which they did not give a fuck about, and except to bring in to be like, oh, that's like so sad and so, um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, where, anyway, somebody get me a Chardonnay, you know. Um, but that, that clip of that media exec was from Sun Valley, and they had pulled it in really tight, so it just looked like, you know, maybe he was sitting outside, but actually behind him was all of these, like, Gulf streams and private planes that were lined up that didn't make it into the frame. So people understand and know what these billionaires are doing, and I think that there's, as there are more billionaires, which is a moral crisis uh, of epic proportions, um, there are more people who are just disgusted. And, you know, this cannot hold, this idea that, um, you know, we watch everybody else eat, you know. And in a place like L.A. where you cannot not work and make it there, it is just, um, and you know, you live in SoCal. Yeah. You step out of the house and you're it's, down 100 bucks. It's really hard. I mean, why is that? Nobody it's just, just coffee and parking. Yeah. And, you know, it's gone. So I think in, in that sense, um, people might not call it an anti-capitalist critique in the way that we do. But people are pissed and they're tired and they're suffering and they're frustrated. And, it, you know, this is where our skills as media and communication scholars, I think, to give language to those kinds of experiences and to remind people also that there could be other futures is, is like this is, um, this is the moment for UDC, right, to appear and, and participate. And I think it's also a moment for us to reflect and say, we can't afford to just be in the university having these conversations. We also need to be out you know, with our families, with our friends, in our communities having these conversations. Framing, framing for folks. I'm looking at Angie here, and I can't not say framing, you know, just like. <laughs> <laughs> Taught me well. No, and actually, I wanted to talk a bit about framing and ask you about, you know, you've been so adept and excellent at framing your work for various audiences, right? The academy, nonprofit organizations, benefactors, as well as the public. What, um, how do you think about how to frame your work for different audiences? and how to position yourself in relationship to your work and to what you want to be getting done. Yeah. Well, the first thing I had to do was reject the way the university was trying to kind of discipline me about how to frame my work. And that was difficult. That was mostly when I was a graduate student when I felt... Um, the good fortune of having been an older student when I went back to grad school. So I went back to the university. You know, I'd had a whole career in advertising and marketing um, in corporate America before I went to grad school. And um, so I had the fortune of not being like 25 or 28 getting a PhD. I think I started grad school when I was 39. And um, in year two of my program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, what um, I know I've got a lot of friends here. Um, uh, this little guy who's sitting here came and joined us in the second year of my grad program. And, um, and then I finished in the third year. And if you're a student here, do not trip off of that because that was just being old and having, <laughs> having, just having the ability to do a lot of work and not really, um, and knowing I had to kind of get back to work. I, could, I didn't have the luxury of like having a life of the mind in the university for five or six years. And, um, and I had incredible support. I mean, Otis was here, you know, really helping, making sure I could just focus on the work. So that was a time where I felt very disciplined by the university experience because I was already what I felt like was a grown person who'd already had a successful career. And then I was kind of put into a power structure that said, you're at the bottom. Um, well, you're like a little bit better than the undergrads, but you're not here to kind of be the expert yet. And, um, and there were things I wanted to work on. So for example, when I was writing the dissertation that eventually became the book Algorithms of Oppression, um, I 
wanted to testify. I don't know if you remember, but the, at that time, the FTC was investigating Google and it's, um, everybody's like, of course we know. Okay, so. <laughs> Preaching that, to the choir. That was happening. You know. And I wanted to go and present the research that I had found about the way that search engines were discriminating. And I was like, this is like going to be so helpful to all these small businesses. And that was a place where, I, a moment where I felt disciplined that I could not go because I didn't have the PhD. And there were people advising me and saying, like, you're not an expert because you don't have the PhD yet. And um, so, like, those moments where I've, like, kind of walked through and thought, okay, I, like, that's a regret that I have, that I didn't just go anyway and um, try to help. So I've, I've just kind of learned that I have to take the chances on myself. And I think a lot of us do, you know, especially, and I see this so much with my students, my graduate students and people who recently graduated, um, how much the university disciplines you to do whatever the senior faculty tell you to do or what your advisor tells you to do or what your committee and then you're kind of always going back like a touchstone to that like am i okay am i doing it right and um i decided that wasn't really viable for me because of the way that it was and um that gave me a lot more freedom because if you just decide, that, well, this is not going to work for me, I'm definitely not asking somebody else if I can speak anymore, then you can actually just be free and do what you need to do. So that has helped me a lot. And everybody should really <laughs> speak. I have had colleagues who, when I was an assistant professor, would say, you know, um, they were told by senior faculty, Things like, you're a junior faculty, you can't speak, um, or you can't sit at you know the main table. You have to sit like on the sides or like whatever. Just ridiculous things that um, I I will name abusive. So I think that um, and we have to do that. I mean, this is also part of like feminist praxis at work. It's just like we're not doing that. <laughs> So that has been very important to just give me some confidence about framing. And it doesn't mean also, and also, okay, so one of the things that's like a joke in our family, but it's not really a joke, um, between Otis and I is like every time I go to give a talk or go to do a thing, he always will text me and say, tell the truth. And um, it's just like a reminder that you can tell the truth and you can you got a home to come to. Like you, you we still got you, whatever you go and do. And I know you're gonna probably do something. <laughs> 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 what were those things that you might have been doing? I mean, he knew that I might go set it off. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, no, I'm like, I'll buy it. Like, come on, you brought it up. Let's see. So, Let's hear some of your greatest hits. Like, I mean, there just might be times when the truth has to be spoken yeah. in any given circumstance. But this idea that we create space for each other, that we tell each other, like, it's okay, tell the truth. You know, we got you when you come back from whatever the fallout of that is. And, um, and that actually empowered me to the degree also that it kind of hasn't always, the other shoe hasn't always dropped negatively. Now, there definitely have been some hard times. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, you read the, the bio and it sounds like just like an easy path to some of these things. And it just so was not. I mean, I, my career has been filled with racial discrimination grievances. My career has been filled with um, tremendous stress that cost me my health in different moments. And, um, you know, learning through that has been um, really the thing. So I try to always remember that I'm not doing brain surgery, and that's good, because nobody wants me doing that. Um, and that takes a pressure off of the kind of work that we do, because I know we feel the sense of urgency. This is the thing. When you are, can witness democracy collapsing, you're like, where's everybody at? Does nobody else see these things? And so, you know, having to figure out constantly how to move through different environments and bring people along. And so that's the kind of thing that I do. So with funders, um, what I do is try to get them to give me money that I can give to other people. And almost all of the work um, that I do in fundraising for my center and for centers that I have led has been to regrant that money to people who would not have the access. So most of my team, for example, is black women. 
And I'm really proud of that. And these are, um, I mean, one of the women who works in my center, um, I want to brag on her a little bit because it's, again, it's a framing issue that I think happened um, as I watched her work. She was a whistleblower at Pinterest. Her name's Ifoma Azoma. Some of you might know her. She um, faced incredible racial discrimination there at Pinterest and then was um, a harassed out of her job, um, not unlike my friend Timnit Jabru, who was the um, person who was the head of ethical AI at Google and then was fired when she said, hey, these products are racist and discriminatory and going to like be terrible. I'd hate to have you do your job. I know. I mean, she's hired to do the thing, and then she gets fired for doing the thing. And so, um, you know, with people like Ifoma who work with me, Timnit, whose board I'm on for DARE, um, the idea here is like, well, let's just support each other hard and support each other's work. When Ifoma got the Silence No More Act passed in California, which was a very important act, it basically precludes now um, companies from being able to use NDAs as a way to silence workers, right? From being able to tell the truth about the horrible products that are being made that are going to be harmful or anything that they're experiencing on the job. This is a major win for workers, the Silence No More Act. When I met Ifoma, we knew each other from the internet, but I, I met her at a meeting, a conference, and, and um, they had, it's one of those things where like they line you up and they say, um, <laughs> there were all these like young, you know, activists and people, organizers, and they were like fresh and energized, and it was very diverse. And they asked us to line up in the room, and they said, line up, and you know, if you've got a lot of energy for the work, and you're feeling good, and you're like ready to go, go on this side. And if you're like somewhere in the middle, go here. And if you're like, I can't take another step, go on this side. All the black women were on this side. And we were like fighting to be like who really should be at the end. Um, and so I meet her at this meeting, and I and I and we're talking, and just kind of quietly to our, each other. And I was like, "Girl, you're so bad with the Silence No More Act." I was like, "Ooh, you know, like whatever you need, however I can support you, I'm into it." And she says, "You know, I did that, and I was living on twenty thousand dollars a year, and I had no health care, and I paid for the lobbyist out of my pocket to do that work, and the two of us did it. And the lobbyist was a black woman." And I was just like, absolutely not, absolutely not. So that she became one of the first people that I was like, we have to raise money around her to stabilize her so she can do her work. And meanwhile, of course, you know, I'm looking out around the country and I'm seeing people who are not black women getting millions, hundreds of millions. I mean, you know, the, um, the tech sector has captured almost every computer science department now in the country. They have really captured the pipeline. The, um, the people who once platformed the tech bros and the tech industry um, got a lot of money for decades, and then, um, and then they decided to become critical, and then they also got all the money. And so there's just a really interesting dynamic, you know, as Tamit and I sit and look out, we're just like, hmm. And, you know, all we can do is figure out how to build community in the communities where we're doing our work with, and this is often with other women, because we know that some of the most brilliant tech critics have also been women, non-binary people, LGBTQ communities, people of color, and a lot of that has been, uh, and that's not just around tech and the internet, but longstanding. And a lot of that is because we just see the harms that are coming, that are befalling our communities. We just see them and we're ready to talk about it, but long before other people are talking about it. And so I think this is the kind of thing that is really, really important that we could be and should be doing among ourselves too. And I will say that it has been... Um, uh, refreshing and amazing to see uh, white men program officers right now in the major foundations who are like trying to do repair. And so you see um, a lot of foundations now are talking about, um, you know, investing in repair, not just like the project, the political project of reparations, but also more broadly the way in which they have so profoundly unevenly funded researchers. 
and um, women researchers and people of color researchers. And so that is probably um, the most important thing I do on like for most of my time now is trying to convince people with money to give it to the people with really good ideas who don't get money. Yeah. Yeah, that is amazing. Can you talk about a lot of these institutions? <laughs> A lot of these institutes that you work with are located within academia, right? They're associated with UCLA, with Cambridge. Here we're co-hosted by the Mike Center, which is a joint venture between Annenberg and Rutgers. Um, can you speak a bit to the politics of doing this kind of work, where you're liaisoning between you know, activists, people working to push the boundaries of what might be possible, and then what we've all I think can acknowledge is an often conservative, bureaucratic, dreary oh. existence. <laughs> if you're a grad student, no, I promise, it's fine. It's awesome. <laughs> Join us. Okay, well, you know, you and I work in the, like, ultra public schools yeah. in California no, and the CSU and the UC, and so we really know, which is, like, no shade on everybody from private school. It's just different. And really hard. And so, <laughs> so. No, when I was at University of Chicago, they're like the tagline was like the administration runs like butter, and I have like had no idea what they meant until I had to like interact and get stuff done, and I was like, oh, you just did that. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay, so that's been the, one of the very difficult parts, and sometimes it almost feels like, well. It's like the federal government and state governments that also are broken in a lot of different ways. And many of you in here know that far better than I do. You study this. Um, you know, I have had many moments of thinking I cannot continue at public school at UCLA because there's so many things that are broken. And that makes it very difficult. OK, you can't hire somebody because it takes eight months to hire them. Um, by the time you've hired them, your grant has expired. And so that doesn't even make sense. Uh, there are so many different, because obviously, we have a, different kinds of oversight by the legislature in public school um, around the country. So that also is a limiting factor. Um, I, when I worked at Illinois, um, Angie here was my, fir my first amazing um, chair um, uh, in the Media and Cinema Studies Department and the ICR uh, when I was an assistant professor, my second year as an assistant professor. And I really took for granted how well Illinois worked until I went you know, to California because that was a place where there was like a will in a different way to get things done. And so I think um, that hampers our ability to like respond quickly to things that we need to be responding to. So one of the things that I did this year, and this might be helpful for some who are thinking about these kinds of bureaucratic um, obstacles, is I moved my center to Code for Science and Society, which some of you may be aware of. Code for Science and Society is a fiscal sponsor, and they're a kind of a nonprofit that helps academics who want to do work that doesn't get like jammed up inside the university. And they really have focused on scientists of a variety of different sort, people like us. Um, so moving the center was really, really powerful because now I just have a completely different apparatus. It's just like, oh, we just hire a person or we can make a micro grant to somebody. I mean, we do a lot of different kinds of work. Like we have, if a grad student's falling through the crack and they're in our orbit and we work with them and they're kind of, um, you know, at UCLA or I'm on a committee or something for them, we can get a check to them so they don't get evicted. You know, those kinds of things are really, really important. I mean, to me, I guess I feel like the point of these organizations called universities is also to be, you know, working in service of the public, of the many publics. And if you can't even do the service part, it's really shameful. You shouldn't have to be a big business that becomes a vendor with, you know, your university in order to get things done. And I, you know, the way my professors at Illinois did it when I was like circling the drain or like oh, those times that payroll didn't hit, well, how did that happen? But like sometimes payroll didn't hit on time when you're a grad student. And I was like, that's not going to work. And um, <laughs> so I had my landlord a, doesn't care. I had some spicy conversations over those years to try to get my money. And so I know at, like in my body what it feels like to 
panic that you can't. And, you know, especially when I had a baby. Um, so I, I, we have to figure out how to work with community organizations, work with partners outside the university, and have way more flexibility to do our work. And not because I look at so many of my colleagues and I feel like we're, we feel downtrodden because we are embarrassed that we can't keep our promises because the institution really breaks them all the time and doesn't like do what it needs to do. So that's, I think, you know, um, valuable. I think with community organizations, you know, one of the things we try to do is like co, again, fundraise with them. Um, Joe Torres is here from Media Justice. Joe, where are you at? Wave your hand. Hi. Okay, so you, this, I, if you don't know Joe Torres' work, you need to know it. Um, like, you know, Media Justice is such like a powerful, important organization around democracy and racial justice and social justice in this country um, and media justice, more, most importantly. And so, like, you know, I'm always like trying to like reach out, you know, our orgs work together, but then I'm always also like, Joe, like, let's write something together or let's do things together because, you know, doing our work outside of just like getting a citation count is important. And I will just say for grad students here, um, one of the things that I always tried to do as well with my work in, in the very beginning, when I was a grad student in early first couple of years as I was working on my book, I knew I was like writing a book for tenure. So I would write the articles and the book chapters as much as possible in like open access journals or in popular press because I felt like ideas needed to get out and I knew that organizations that we might be working with or activists would be able to just go and they wouldn't be, it would, our work wouldn't be trapped behind paywalls. And now with my students, I, um, I, you know, I try to get co-author with them all the time um, on like chapters and things that can be out so that their work can also be out and accessible. That was like a, another one of those things where I was told absolutely do not do that by senior faculty. And I was like, I'm 100% I'm doing that. <laughs> uh, so that's a thing where, you know, again, I feel like that is a feminist praxis is that we don't just do our work so that it is only available to 300 people who read that journal. We need to do more, and this is a time I feel like we're at, I know every generation says there it's like the critical juncture, but in the spirit of like the Dallas Smythe legacy, we have a responsibility to put critical scholarship in spaces and places where it's accessible. So it's embarrassing, and guess what? You know how many, I mean, there is a lot of shade rolling on that Rolling Stone thing right now. And you have to do that, because that is where people are. I mean, a certain kind of person, and certain kinds of people that read a magazine like that. But you know, I was always trying to get in like Essence Magazine and places where black women were. And um, I think we have to, uh, not let the bureaucracy and the culture and the kind of hegemonic ways that universities work, like we have to model inside what it means to democratize those too. And that's one of the reasons I think I stay in a, in a public university. And I'm always trying to figure out, like I'm always trying to figure out how to have tentacles and relationships into private schools because they need to share the money with the public institutions, because if the public institutions die, that is part of the anti-democratic project that's underway, is killing these public institutions. So we have, we can do repair across institutions too, and I think we should be, UDC is such a great place where we could be like scheming those kinds of things too, yeah. Yeah, and there's so, so much interesting, um, themes coming through in these comments, both about like legitimacy and challenging the ways in work, the ways in which our work in the academy is legitimized or not legitimized, as well as like legibility across various communities that we're speaking with and the question of praxis. And I guess I want to ask sort of at this moment, what sort of um, theorizations or methodologies or, you know, what can we do that is new? What can we do to push things forward? Well, one of the things that I have really cared about and theorizing around the internet is um, 
I've been trying to work with what what does it mean to decolonize the stack? So, and it's like, you know, the technology stack. Because I think, you know, my first book was really about what I think of as kind of like the software layer, the search engine, and maybe some to some degree like infrastructure. And I've written some articles that are about like why we need a black feminist technology studies paradigm. Because what it, what it allows, what black studies allows and opens up to me, and I think this is similar for Chicano Latino studies, American Indian studies, um, Asian American studies, is a more diasporic way of looking at our work. So I try right now um, to theorize like what, what would it mean to decolonize the internet um, that is more than just thinking about the monopolies that overdetermine what happens in tech in the West, but also we would have to account for the neocolonial relationships that start in extraction and mining industries. We would have to account for manufacturing, where that happens, who participates, what kind of workers are involved in manufacture, who is hyper-targeted for consumption, which is where I feel like black people, we are hyper-targeted for consumption because our culture is used to launch most of these products and to make them cool and interesting. Um, from Vine to Black Twitter, Periscope, and Facebook Live, many times they're made popular at our expense on the backs of the, um, I mean, we wouldn't know, really have known about Facebook Live had it not been for that um, Philandro Castile's murder was captured on it. So, uh, and then there's just, you know, the waste and disposal of electronics. Uh, and the incredible environmental cost at every layer of the stack. So I think that is a way to theorize the internet. And for me, I use um, black in radical intellectual traditions to be able to apprehend like what does it, what does the internet also do to help us um, strengthen a pan-Africanist approach to, I mean, I feel like I'm in the 70s saying this, but I'm not. I'm not only in 2023. <laughs> but, but the truth is, these, um, these diasporic connections are really important. And we need to be thinking in, about the internet in these kind of anti-colonial ways. So that, that's one thing. Um, methodologically, I mean, I, I prefer the method of the close reading in my work. Um, I, I have definitely been encouraged to do like big data quanti quantified kinds of studies, but I'm like, you could just tell the story of how messed up it was and then people will get it. And uh, so I like to just tell the messed up story, the close reading, if you will. Um, and I learned that from, you know, feminist scholars as well who, who helped us, like who have to narrate because you know, their work is not necessarily believed otherwise, and so we have to like put in this texture. But I also think that this, the, um, ultimately, I'm not really interested in just criticizing the internet, so I should just be really upfront about that. My critique of the internet and various kinds of next network technologies and AI is about how they flatten the human experience. I'm really invested in the human experience. I'm really invested in people and, and communities and society. I don't want us to all be reduced to ones and zeros. I don't want us to be reduced to a data set. I don't want a moment of our past to be used to predict our futures, which is what I see with AI and why I, I talk about that. And so the stories and the richness of all of our stories we know will be lost in these dis different kinds of systems. And that means then there's no space for who we might be. There's no space for redemption from the terrible things we've done that we can move through and beyond. There's no space of repair for um, conflicts 
that need to be healed. And I'm really into that because I think um, the technology, like there's some of it that's fun and interesting, but it's still with the overarching like landscape of the surveillance state, it makes it really difficult to tease out what the affordances are. It feels like it's much more consequence than affordance right now. Um, so that's to me like the, the method is to tell the stories of what we will lose, what parts of ourselves we will lose. Um, and I think that, you know, that might give us more space, at least in, in my mind, for us to say like, oh, well, maybe we don't want the billionaires to techno design the world for us, which by the way, they have very terrible ideas. Okay, <laughs> very terrible ideas. And, and we're relinquishing too much. Um, they're happy to see the world thinned out by billions of people, okay? And we know who those billions are gonna be. They're not, they're not gonna be like, they're gonna be us. There's already like an effort to undermine intellectuals and thinkers and, and critical thinkers and critical scholars, artists. Um, so it's really important that we like fight and hold on to our space because we have better ideas and um, we are invested in our humanity and the humanity of our communities. And to me, that is actually really the project of theorization. That's really beautiful. And it reminds me a lot when we were discussing um, over our conversations the past few weeks, you know, we were talking about feminist praxis and critical scholarship as a sort of a utopian project. Yeah. Right? You can't underdo, undergo what we do without thinking that there is something better we can arrive at. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And so I want to like kind of end with my last question before we open up for Q&A, okay. revisiting the conference theme, Left Undone. Yes. Right? There's a double meaning here that's available, right? And so thinking about how do we remain optimistic in the face of what we're, of the historical present? Yes. So do a little Benjamin throw out. And, um, you know, and how do we maintain solidarity as we attempt to, cr to fight on these various fronts? Yeah. Uh, that's a really, I mean, that's an amazing question. And, and your answer will be the final word on this topic. Okay. So well, right. great. And here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us in this room come from peoples who have been oppressed or are oppressed. We have our experiences. And we also know that we are, um, you know, my grandparents, um, it's really amazing to be in Philadelphia because my father always told me the story that my grandfather, who I didn't know very well, was from the Gullah Islands. And he, when he was about five or six years old, was sold to a white man in Philadelphia. And he came, and so our, my dad's people are from Philadelphia. And, um, and he was basically indentured to him. I mean, my grandfather, I am not that old. I know it's a lot of hair dye, but it's not, I'm not that, I'm Gen X, you know? So my gen, I'm Gen X, my grandfather is sold. And, you know, into an enslaved um, situation. And he um, is, like, emancipated from that around 16. And, you know, he marries my, um, he meets my grandmother. I don't know the story of how they met. But she was from Mississippi, and she was born into sharecropping and was a, a sharecropper herself. And they together made their way to California. And they made money, and as they were making money, they bought all of my grandmother's siblings um, out of sharecropping, which is basically buying them out of slavery. And um, my grandmother had about a, um, uh, this is my black grandma, um, my grandmother had about an eighth grade, probably, education. And so, um, was it a utopia for them to imagine a completely different future for their generations, absolutely. That is utopian thinking that we're not gonna just be stuck. And um, thank God, I mean, I think that of myself and I look at my son and my kids, my daughter and our family as the manifestation of somebody's dream. Somebody held a space, my mother, my um, grandparents, for, for us. So we have to hold a space that is rooted in knowing really hard things have happened before us 
and and we can um, like elbow more space. And that's not just as individuals or as family units, but that's as communities. And I think you know about black people in this country having had millions of acres of land. I think I just saw this thing that was like 15, after the Civil War, we had something like 15 million acres of lands, and now it's like down to, you know, like just a handful of acres of land that black people own in this country, um, which, you know, we can even contest, should we own land, right? I mean, is, is the anti-capitalist project also that we abolish the sense of property rights, right? That that we own, the, like that maybe we steward the earth differently rather than own it um, and objectify it in that way. So, you know, I, I think that this is really important, um, at least I'll just say in my own work and what kind of gets me out of bed every day to work on it is I just don't want to see the foreclosure of the future for these possibilities, where instead when you're in kindergarten and elementary school and high school, all of your grades go through learning management systems and all kinds of predictive analytics are made about you and then the system decides whether you get to go to college or whether you get to have a job or whether you get to um, live somewhere and all of these kinds of um, predictive analytic systems that are looking for patterns of who can be successful and who will be disposable. And that is actually to me what I am working on is just ensuring to some degree that I can raise um, uh, the alarm that, that, that those things are happening in spaces and places not like UDC, where you all already know this, but in places where people are not thinking about that and don't know that as their you know, baby's face is getting scanned, that that's part of a, a, a political project of, that, of control over their lives, um, over our lives. So that, to me, is... Um, I don't know what the question was, and now I'm just gonna stop <laughs> because I think I've I've lost the the thread. But um, um, but I will just say here as before we go to questions that um, Christina, it's like such an honor to get to be in conversation with you. Okay. You know, you were um, you were ahead of me in in grad school, and you and um, people like Molly Neeson and um, Brian and others. You know. Uh, really also were part of that kind of like creating space for us to like feel like we could um, have radical ideas. I will say we need to put out like um, bananas ideas for people to think about. And so one of the things you and I talked about also before this panel was some of you might have been at ICA and heard me say on the opening panel, I don't know, a year or so ago, um, that we need the kinds of ideas where um, which I say this to my students all the time. No, and I just, I loved this comment so much and it stuck with me. I and know, so I was, so I'm like, glad you brought it up. I, I was like, we're like I don't know how to work it in without being like, <laughs> if you tough. weren't at ICA in Paris, you really missed one fire of a panel. Like, this was amazing. <laughs> it was a setup and then I had to just tell the truth. So in one of the, the comments, I just said, you know, if we want to, like really have radical imaginaries. And I, I say this to my students all the time, like I'll hold up my phone and I'll say, you know, don't come and tell me about the new app you made. I'm disinterested. <laughs> tell me about how we're gonna make a phone that when it expires, we can eat it or we can plant it in the ground and grow a tree. Like, you know, or it's got like, let's get an imaginary that isn't a, like a zero sum game. Of, of the earth filled with trash, right? But something that is really remarkable. And also, I'm not talking about Neuralink. I'm not talking about putting a chip in your body either. I'm talking about <laughs> maybe we have more opportunities to be together so we don't need the phone. I don't know. Like, there's lots of other ways to imagine the world. And that was one of the things that I said on that panel. And I guess I would just say that... Um, I'm really grateful to get to spend this hour with you tonight and um, to share some ideas. And I feel um, like I'm you know, stand, sitting here before a lot of giants in our field and in the legacy of somebody who's a giant like Dallas Smythe. And um, I think he would call upon us, like many giants, to say, like, I can't cuss because this is being recorded. Um, and I already dropped one up. I don't think we mind. <laughs> <laughs> we just, you know, we have to just say enough and, you know, stay persistent in our work and stay, you know, um, righteous 
about this project and building relationships. Um, right now, what's happening in Gaza is a very profound opportunity for us to demonstrate and to embody and to live a politics of solidarity and of healing and of repair. And that is very hard work. Um, there's a, a massive you know, movement for racial justice afoot in this country and has been for hundreds of years um, for repair for indigenous and First Nations people. And we should not lose sight that the solidarity work just happens by being in the work. And it's not out there, and I don't think it's all in the papers. I think it's in like our relationships and, and our support for each other. Now, Christina promised me that the Q&A was not going to feel like a dissertation defense. So I beg I of you, I will come, come do after not you if you make us not feel like a dissertation defense. <laughs> We're not doing that. But who wants to participate or join in the conversation with us? Yeah. Anyone have questions? In the back? Oh, wait. Sorry. We'll take a few at a time. So, Andrew, why don't you go first, and then yeah, this, we'll... This is a question of my master's students um, who, fortunately, have had the pleasure of of uh, having Sophia and, and Noam be a, a part of our classes. Uh, one that's been repeated many times, but I thought that a lot of folks here would be interested in, in hearing about. Um, they're most keen on knowing because uh, they've jumped right ahead and said, oh, well, this conglomerate situation is crazy. These are multi-trillion dollar valued uh, entities that are autocratic. I mean, beyond my wildest dreams sometimes they're saying this stuff. And um, what we want to know is how we can fix it. And so they, a lot of them have written uh, papers on policy reform and done some amazing stuff. And they really are curious to learn what your hopes are um, of a possible breakup of, of uh, alphabet happening. Um, let's, let's assume it will, right? Yeah. Let's say 90s Microsoft uh, doesn't have some appeals court overturn its breakup and, and um, alphabet has to break up. Will that, how much will that help? And what and and to what else needs to be done? Uh, because obviously that's not a panacea, right? Yeah. So I didn't mean it to be a dissertation question. <laughs> no, that's a good question. I, I'll lay it down my students if it is. No, no. Should we take a? Can I hit that real quick? Yeah, do you want to do it? Okay. One of the things that I think we need to be thinking about is that it, you know, it's very likely that. Um, Alphabet will be broken up. I think they're already starting, you know, the, the writing on the wall is that um, they're kind of already positioning YouTube to be spun out, um, just in terms of what I understand from people inside, that um, inside, um, <laughs> they're, uh, they're in the joint. Um, uh, so I think you, we should expect to see YouTube and maybe some other products spun out um, and th that they're kind of already kind of preparing for that. Obviously, Lena Khan, our um, dear FTC chair, is, you know, about breaking up Amazon. She's, that's been her project, and um, I hope she'll get a chance to see that through. On the other side of it, I think w we often anticipate like, oh, these breakups will happen and then that's going to be the thing. But I don't think that's the thing, obviously, because look at Microsoft, um, too. Um, what I've been trying to talk to funders about, people who have money, is to not only give us the money, but that we need to be prepared. And this might be something that among us we can be thinking about. Um, when those assets are spun off, it's usually like hedge funds that just go pick up those assets. So then that is not solving the problem. We need to be thinking, I think, about alternate kinds of community ownership models that can go in and get those assets and run those assets differently. And so those are like those are missed opportunities that I think of the past that we should be thinking about for the future. Uh, Otherwise, you know, I think it'll those those assets get spun off to the highest bidders, and we don't again. Then we just we're not solving um, the problem. So I think that's going to be a, a to me that's the strategy that I'm trying to to organize to some degree. People with money who would 
give it to us. I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> who would it part with it, with it so that we could yes. own things to together? Us. Just give it to <laughs> us. We got it, you know? Um, but we can't just do that as like grassroots organizations. I mean, there are people in this room, you know, now I'm like looking at Victor and I'm looking at others who really, really know and understand um, municipal control and other kinds of models, media ownership models of control, many of you in this room. But I think this is gonna be a moment for us and we should have plans and not just like theoretical plans, but we should have like plans, plans for that. Do you still have your question? Yeah. Yes. And then you're, you'll be next. Um, I'm Lauren, uh, and I'm a recent grad student from Africa. This year I'm a fellow, next year I'm studying as assistant professor. I keep asking myself, how do we do this work? So critical scholarship, thinking, anti-colonial, decolonial frameworks, feminist black epistemologies, uh, and not be silenced, not be dismissed, not uh, lose our chance at tenure because we are, uh, because of politics that go above us. Um, so yeah, what advice would you give to someone starting their career? Um, yeah, and how to navigate <laughs> this like very sticky uh, academic world with, without getting silenced? Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations to you and all of your colleagues here who are assistant professors. How many people are postdocs, assistant professors, PhD students, just to have a sense of it? Okay, come on now. All right. Okay. Great. So the first thing I want to say is um, we have a responsibility, those of us who didn't raise our hands that are in institutions, to um, grab a hold of you. And I feel very fortunate that um, a lot of women in this field grabbed me and helped me. And um, I feel like I keep looking at Angie too much. But I'm going <laughs> to say that um, we will write the letters for you all, the tenure letters. You know, we're, that's our job is to grab a hold of you in these ways, to um, tell our colleagues about this dope person or that amazing person, because we do that too. And that, you know, um, we need to know who's, who's around, who's trying to get jobs, what's going on with the folks, so that part of it is like, we gotta know and be sharing so that we can figure out how to network. And, um, you know, it's so, I love us because, you know, the good old boys, they are about that, um, like, networking good old boy life. You know what I'm saying? Like, they so hook each other up. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and we need to also be hooking each other up, like, in, in these ways. And so part of that is, like, I think we have a very good, I mean, I don't know, a lot of the um, women in non-binary, LGBTQ, people of color um, networks um, are talking constantly and trading information. So that is very valuable, that information. And also getting good mentorship. And, and by that, I don't mean in a like, um, I know and you don't know, but more like, I'm a little bit ahead of you in the job process. So one of the best things that ever happened in my career was a senior woman, a black woman, when I was at Illinois, my first year as an assistant professor. She gave me all her materials. And she was like, here's my cover letter, here's my CV. I was very intimidated by it. Um, I was like, I have one page of things, <laughs> and she has 30, okay. Um, but I used that template, which was brilliant, and every job I've ever applied for, I've had that as like a model, to a touchstone. And I've given mine to all of my students and students who work with me or people who ask because I feel like there's so little transparency into these processes and we need to stop that. So everybody who's got good materials, share them with someone who does not. <laughs> and help, we need to help each other because we also, um, we can do so many things and, and this is where working together jointly authoring things. I mean, I remember when I was a grad student asking one of my professors if, I, if they would write with me, and they were like, absolutely not. We don't do that. You know what I mean? Because it was like a, you know, human, humanities, social science oriented kind of work that's like solo authored. And these like great men of science modalities are nonsense. We, 
there are things, yes, you know, we might have to toil and write the book ourselves, or we might have to grind out those articles, but it's not outside of community, right? And all of the people who read my work and gave me feedback and all those things, we are here to do that with each other. So that is my advice, is to not see yourself outside of those networks and to get inside those and ask for support. And I think, you know, UDC is a, is a community that could, and, and other communities that can do that and, um, and hit me up after this. <laughs> I'll help you. All right. on a social media site that I guess shall not be named. But while I was thinking of the question that I listened to your first answer, and I was thinking maybe we could buy Twitter evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got five on it. <laughs> um, but that said, um, I, don't, I love all the focus on uh, imagining futures because I think that's the only way to also stay connected to the humanity. But, I was feeling a little bit defensive this morning because yesterday I saw that Chris Rufo is targeting the word decolonization now. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. So I was wondering if, if you're going to think about, like, can we get ahead of it? You know, because like critical race theory was targeted and intersectionality was targeted <coughs> and we're sucked into this political discourse. Yeah. Uh, which I think is very hard sometimes to use the word decolonization to be used in the right context, right? So, Okay, and then, and then uh, The Atlantic has an article in which they're, I know I'll throw the show not being named, uh, wrote how we should be wary of people using the language of colonizers and oppressors to mask fascism or gosh, something bad. And he's basically saying uh, he's, he's, he's organizing discourse around what's happening in Gaza, right? So, the way in which the pipeline for this word to be taken and used exactly the way these and I'm wondering, do we have any strategies? Do you think of any ways that we can get ahead of the, the, the extraction of this language, which is still useful? Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Do you know, just get losing to a broader political discourse that sucks out of meaning and turns it into a weapon? Yes. I know there are people in this room who have better responses than I'm going to have to that, I will say that like the, the, the stealing of our language and our concepts and the distortion of them um, is not new, you know? And I don't, I think, um, you know, it is a scary time. My colleagues at UCLA who are in the law school, the, some of the most well-known critical race scholars, study scholars in the world were targeted with death threats at their homes and, um, that it, it's a very terrifying moment for a lot of people who maybe didn't see themselves as people who should be getting death threats because they're writing law review articles, you know, like, I don't know. So I think, um, you know, or they see themselves as like intellectuals that are not of a particular threat in the way in which we're characterized. So I think um, I do not want to underestimate the degree to which there is threat. Um, we all work on college campuses where people are harmed. Faculty, I'm trying to be thoughtful because little people are in the room. Um, so these are real, these are the real consequences of fascism, right, and white supremacy. But also they're not new. <coughs> So I think, you know, no one can outlanguage us. I don't know, maybe that's because I'm like, black people, like, as soon as our words are taken by white people, we got new words. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I, just to lighten it up a little bit. Like, I think that we, um, you know, it's like woke, you know, I mean, like a council. I mean, there's just like, I could just name so many words. Yeah. So I think we have to um, just be dynamic and be flexible and keep communicating the point. And we also are, don't have to communicate defensively about our words and our language and our paradigms. We can also proactively name, which most people in this room do with their work, name those who would harm us, those who would want to raise up you know, ethnostates, those who would want to raise up um, exclusionary, hostile, 
homophobic. I mean, we can name on so many different axes the types of narrow um, futures, right? So I think we just have to also proactively keep naming what that is. And when they take our words, we, we narrate differently. And that, to me, feels more like what people have always had to do. Um, and we are also refiners. I mean, that's the one thing that I love. I have not been scholarly tonight, um, a little bit on purpose, but uh, words have meaning. And we're very precise in this occupation about the words that we use and the reference that we make. And we have to keep doing that. And, and that's all I think we can do. I don't know. If other people have better ideas, please say them. Because I think that it's, um, it's not appropriate for us to give up a framework like decolonization. It's not appropriate for us to just give up critical race theory. Like, oh, well, now they, they tell us we can't say white supremacy anymore or talk about American history. And so I guess we can't because we're going to be captured. Like, that's just, we're not doing that either. Uh, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. and I want to. I'm hoping Add. we can end on a high note. Let's get a better question that has me say not want to burst into tears, which is what your question has me. <laughs> so I know I'm I'm really sympathetic about what what this moment feels like. And maybe this is an opportunity to, to revisit that. But what is the next fight that you want to have, and what does it look like to win it? I tell my students all the time that I'm trying to solve structural racism and inequality because my real next book after we do that is about the world's best swim up bars. I'm writing, I'm like, <laughs> I intend to write this book in my lifetime about the world's best swim up bars because I won't have to work on these things. Um, and they think that I'm joking, and I'm not joking. I really want to write that coffee table book. I really see it. So I think we, um, OK, so what I'm working on and interested in is more stories and more storytelling and trying to um, take the, the brilliant ideas that are in our communities and in academia and do more translation work to mass audiences. I know a lot of us don't believe in like mass media anymore because, ugh, but also it is the place where, you know, my mother-in-law is, and I love her so much, and I want her in on these conversations, right? I mean, guess what? Guess what she understood? She understood that Rolling Stone article, right? She was like, give me that. What is that? Are you going to sign that? You know, she was so awesome. And she's reading into these conversations. It's like, oh, OK, and my sister's in law. And so the storytelling of our complex ideas into the world is very, very important. Making that work legible. If there's anything that I think I am known for, for better or worse, is that I write in a way that I, and I believe that black feminist writing is about writing for other black women to read and not using language and ideas and stories that obfuscate knowledge from our communities. And, and everybody here can do black feminist writing. Everyone in this room, you don't have to be a, a black woman, all right? You can take these modalities, bring them into your work, and think about what does it mean for us to do this translational work. So that is really what I'm working on right now. I'm writing a, a, a small one of those little 20,000 word books. I know saying like little 20,000 word doesn't even <laughs> compute, but apparently that's what they're called. Um, for Polity um, in their Debating Race series. Uh, which always asks a question, so like Jonathan Marks wrote, um, is science racist? You, you know that the answer could just be like one word, yes, yeah. and then there's no, <laughs> there's no meat in there. David Theo Goldberg wrote, are we all, are we all post-racial yet? You know, they're kind of like these books that ask a question, and then you have to, in 20,000 words instead of one. So I was asked to write, is the internet racist? And instead, I think I'm going to write something that's more along the lines of, like, will the internet kill us? Because I want to respond to these, like, long-termists and the way that they have control over the narrative about the future of AI killing us all. Um, so I'm, I'm writing a little... 20,000 word book, it'll be out next year, and it is about doing some of this work of like translating to a lay, a public audience so that the principals, the teachers, 
that anybody who's interested can pick this up and feel like they can get in on the conversation, have at least a paragraph that they can take into their worlds and say, and be smart at a cocktail party or whatever the things are, and um, speak back at city council meetings, speak back to school districts about the constant datification of ourselves. Um, and uh, hopefully that will be like another thing that we all can kind of have in the back pocket to throw at somebody um, if it's good enough. I, my so it's going to be a hard cover, so it'll really hit them. It's like, no, it's a soft cover. <laughs> it's soft. It's like for the back pocket. got to work but, on our angle. Yeah, I know. I know. But that that is something that I, I'm excited about um, because I feel like uh, 10 years ago when I said to my dissertation committee, um, you know, what I think the real central issue here is that the algorithms them are coded in racist and sexist ways. The, the, the math is racist. No one was down for that conversation. I'm going to tell you right now, it was hard to find the four people to be on the committee. I mean, very hard. No one wanted to put their career on that. Absolutely not. And um, now... Everyone is like, girl, these racist ass algorithms. You know, like, they, I mean, everybody is in on that conversation. Your students come in, they're like, so. Students are like, I don't know if you realize this. They're, you know. Did, didn't your book agent or, or no, your um, commission editor? My publisher was like, you cannot, yeah, at NYU Press, she was like, um, she's amazing, Eileen Kalish. Some of you may have worked with her. She said, I said, I want to name this book. You know, Molly Neeson helped me brainstorm. She, she takes credit for coming up with the name. I'm not sure if that's true. But she was part, she was <laughs> sure part of the brainstorm. Combined with some Charles she Shaw. The, you know. Yes, the brainstorm. Exactly. And um, I said, I want to name this book Algorithms of Oppression. And NYU Press was like, absolutely not. That is, no one knows what an algorithm is. This was in 2012 when I got my book contract. She said, no one knows what an algorithm is. Absolutely not. So you know me. Y'all knew I was in marketing before that for the next four years while I was writing that book until it came out um, in 2018. I named every single talk. Oh, those of you who invited me to come and give talks for you, I named every talk Algorithms of Oppression. <laughs> and then the, the internet indexed it. And then it, that was a thing. And so then they couldn't say no because we're going to walk away from all this brand equity. What are you doing? <laughs> So that's a pro tip for my grad students in here and my assistant professors. Just name the things, the things you want to name it, and call it that as much as you can and will it into existence. And so that's what I'm working on. Yeah, on behalf of the entire steering committee of the Union for Democratic Communications, a really heartfelt and sincere thank you so much thank for joining you. us this evening. It was very moving. Thank you, Christina, for facilitating. Uh, with that, it's been fantastic and really tremendously moving to me to see so many folks come out for this. And it's been moving to see so many folks reconnecting and creating new connections. And I hope that we can continue this with the new steering committee going forward.